Thank you, Madam President and members. I, too, was struck by the question from our President Pro Tem, who asked, how many times do we get to cast a vote like this one? And in my case, by virtue of term limits, the answer is quite frequently, actually. I'm looking back at my own voting record. In 2002, I was not only an I vote, but a co-author on then State Senator Costa's measure to place the high-speed rail bond on the ballot, an I vote and a co-author signature. In 2004, when then Assembly Member Bogue said, no, we ought to hold this off until 2010, I was one of a handful of Assembly members who said, no, I feel the sense of urgency. We have to move forward with this visionary notion. And I voted against that delay. In 2008, when Assembly Member Galgiani put the high-speed rail bond up before us, I was not only an I vote, I was once again a co-author. Then, of course, we had a chance to vote on Prop 1A on the ballot. I went into the polling place, voted I, and supported the measure publicly. Over the past four years, as the chair of the Senate Budget Subcommittee with responsibility for transportation funding, I had the opportunity to vote repeatedly on requests for funding by the High-Speed Rail Authority and voted for every dollar they requested because I wanted them to be successful. On the legislative front, I've consistently rebuffed legislative efforts to shut the authority down, including, as my colleague Senator LaMalfa knows, two attempts on his part in 2011 and 2012 to bring the project to a halt. And at home, over these last four years since the bond measure has passed, I have consistently told my constituents that I am a supporter of high-speed rail done right in spite of the plummeting support for high-speed rail in my district. Now, there are a lot of good reasons to be for high-speed rail. Let's start with the vision. It's a vision I happen to share. I think high-speed rail makes sense for California. I think our geography, our economy, our population centers all lend themselves to high-speed rail. But we're not being asked to vote on a vision today. We're being asked to vote on a particular plan. So the question we have to ask ourselves today is even if you support the vision, is this a plan that is worthy of our support? There are other good reasons to vote for high-speed rail. Certainly the jobs that have been identified any one of us who goes back home and talks to our constituents at sidewalk office hours or in town halls, as I know we all do, knows too many people are out of a job, too many people are worrying about whether or not they're going to be able to make the rent or the mortgage. But this isn't a jobs versus a no jobs debate. This is a question about whether or not we generate good jobs with the right plan or the wrong plan. So let's not say this is a choice of jobs or no jobs when it's really about whether or not we're going to use the right plan and make the right kind of investment to realize the vision in order to produce those jobs. Now, there's another good reason, and this one doesn't get mentioned much, to vote for high-speed rail. The voters went to the polls and approved it, Madam President. And forgive me if I sound a little old-fashioned, but elections have consequences. When the public tells us this is our will, we have an obligation to listen. But voter sentiment has undeniably changed in the intervening years. And even if the voter sentiment hadn't changed, there's no arguing that this is a very different plan before us today, both in scope and content and price. And finally, and we've heard reference to this already, and we'll hear reference, I'm sure, in the rest of the debate today, there's that $3.3 billion in federal funding. Under our current circumstances, who wouldn't be lured by the opportunity to access $3.3 billion of federal funding? But let's understand at what cost those funds might come to California. We're talking about a $68.5 billion project. The $3.3 billion we're talking about represents about 
of the money involved if the project stays on budget. We're expected then to put up 20 times that amount over the course of who knows how many years. So let's keep the dollar amounts in perspective. Even at our level, 3.3 billion is no small number, but it pales in comparison to the 60 plus billion the state of California is then obliged to find in order to access those dollars. And even more disconcerting to me, as we cast a anxious eye at those $3.3 billion, is the result of the polling we saw just this week, but you didn't have to read the polling. Any of us who talk to our folks know that they're asking the same questions. They're saying, really, you made these cuts, we're threatened with more, and you want to build a high-speed rail train. And I think you can make a very good argument that in tough times, you forge ahead with big and bold projects. But I know what the impact will be if the revenue bond measure, excuse me, if the revenue measure fails on November's election day. We all do. Now I think, and I think I'm within the rules here, Madam President, I think there are more folks who support the governor's revenue measure on this side of the room than there are on that side of the room. But it's a $40 billion revenue risk if we lose the governor's tax measure on election day in November. So in order to access that $3.3 billion, our own long knowledge as elected officials, the conversations we have with people on a daily basis, and the survey results from around the state tell us we are putting that $40 billion of revenue at risk on Election Day if we move ahead today with this high-speed rail measure. And how are we going to feel if we wake up on Wednesday, the day after Election Day, and look at the trigger cuts, the $40 billion that will have to be pulled painfully from the budget, from schools, from colleges, from universities, from health, from welfare and public safety. How glad will we be then that we got $3.3 billion in federal funding for high-speed rail if we have put the future of the state at risk in that way? We may not think that's the way it ought to be, but the hard political reality is that's the way folks back home are thinking about these trade-offs. Now, I understand that whenever we tackle a project of this magnitude, it requires us to take a leap of faith. But as the old adage would have it, look before you leap. And if you take a look, here's what you'll find with respect to the basic plan that's before us today. It's proposed that we spend $3.3 billion of federal funds and $2.7 billion of state funds for 130 miles of rail in the Central Valley. That is the core of the measure before us. That is three quarters of the funding that's in the bill we'll be voting on today. So if that's what you pay and that's what you get, it raises some obvious questions about where do we go from here? How do we do more? And so here are those obvious questions and answers. Is there an additional commitment of federal funds? There is not. Is there an additional commitment of private funding? There is not. Is there a dedicated funding source we could look to in the coming years? There is not. The administration, of course, has suggested the possibility of using cap and trade revenue, Madam President, in order to fund future expansion if necessary. But those are dollars we have yet to see. If and when we do see them, our legislative analyst has already suggested they may not be lawfully or appropriately used for these purposes. And even if we do see them and can use them, then by definition, it will have been at the expense of other programs and services 
where those dollars might have gone. Now, it's always possible, of course, that two, five, or 10 years from now, additional federal funding will be forthcoming. But as the High Speed Rail Authority itself acknowledged in our hearing in December, it's hard to see that time over any reasonable horizon, given the current lay of the land. And, of course, we could go back to the voters with yet another $10 billion plan for more bonds for next steps. But I think it more than a little unlikely that the taxpayers would be so inclined. And in fact, the authority has said they have no plans to do so. Now, all of this talk about where do the dollars come from is important because if you can't find any more money, then you have to ask yourself, what is it you get for that $6 billion? And in transportation jargon, the question they ask is, well, if we don't know if we're going to have more money and we don't know if we can do more, what's the independent utility of the thing we're going to build? I think plain folks would just say, what's the standalone value of that investment? And so when we asked the High Speed Rail Authority, they told us, well, it's 130 miles of track. And we said, is it high speed rail? And the answer was no. Is it electrified? No. Does it have positive train control? No. You're going to run high speed rail cars on it? No. So we're getting an upgraded Amtrak in the Central Valley for $6 billion. All of our federal money and a quarter or more of our state money for 130 miles of not high-speed rail. And oh, by the way, it's in a low ridership area, a place that the authority and their peer review group acknowledge is low ridership in the sense that it has about a million potential riders as compared or contrasted with 28 million at the north and southern ends of the state. So the question that we have before us today, Madam President, members, is not do you share the vision, but rather this, is this a plan that is worthy of support? We could talk about the management challenges we've seen over the last four years, but time does not permit. We could talk about the fact that the folks we're asking to implement this still don't have a management team in place, just hired their CEO the third in three years, three weeks ago, don't have a COO, don't have a CFO, don't have a risk manager, and yet unappointed, untested, and unproven, we want to start down this $68.5 billion path without adequate oversight. We could talk about the fact that the administration has already acknowledged that it wants CEQA exemptions or exceptions or modifications as the project goes five, six, seven hundred, eight hundred miles through the state, providing presumably less protection for people's businesses, homes, farms, open space. We could talk about the fact that this isn't just a handful of critics in the legislature. The Legislative Analyst Office, the peer review group, the independent inspector general, the state auditor, and the Institute for Transportation Studies at Berkeley have all raised significant concerns. And even looking at this newly revised plan, the Legislative Analyst Office says the risk is too great and recommends against proceeding with the plan. Now, before I close, Madam President, and I just wanted to give you some reason for optimism on that front, there are a lot of good arguments on both sides of this debate. And I think after the last four years, I've probably heard most, if not all of them. But let me tell you the argument that I did not find particularly persuasive. I wasn't persuaded when folks said, Joe, you know, this thing's going to pass. Eventually, the votes will be there on the floor, 
It's something that leadership at several levels wants to see happen. And the smart thing to do would be to simply go along with the program. I'm betting that's the conversation that took place back in 1996 when the legislature went along with the program and approved the deregulation that I confronted as a new member in 2001 and that cost the state billions. Billions we are still paying as we sit or stand here today having this debate. I'm betting that in 1999, when the pension measure that we all know as SB 400 came to the floor for a debate, people said, oh, just go along with the program. And here we are, a decade later, trying to untangle the billions of dollars in costs that the governor has so rightfully and appropriately identified as requiring attention through his pension reform efforts. So I'm asking myself today, if the measure's going to pass, and if it's something that my leadership supports, is there some reason I shouldn't go along with the program? And I think the uh, answer to that is there are billions of reasons why none of us should simply go along with the program unless we are convinced in good faith, as many of my colleagues are, that this is the right plan and that the plan will genuinely allow the state to realize the right vision. I wish I could come to that conclusion, Madam President. I certainly give thanks and respect both to the chair of the Budget Committee and to the President Pro Tem, who have been eminently fair about letting members have the opportunity to make their case on this issue. But regrettably, the only conclusion I can come to today is that this is the wrong plan in the wrong place at the wrong time, and I will be a no vote.